Hi everyone, welcome back to the Internet Reports Pulse Update, where we keep our finger on the pulse of how the internet is holding up week over week. This week, we're unpacking recent outages of the social media giants, including Facebook owner Meta and Microsoft's LinkedIn. We'll also be discussing disruptions for customers of Comcast and satellite TV provider DirecTV. I'm Barry Collins, and I'll be hosting today with the amazing Mike Hicks, Principal Solutions Analyst at Thousand Eyes. As always, we've included chapters in the episode description below, so you can skip ahead to the sections that are most interesting to you. And if you haven't already, we'd love you to take a moment to like and subscribe. For all our YouTube listeners, don't forget that we also release this show on all the major podcast platforms. So feel free to give us a follow over at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen. Before we get to the social media firms, let's start with a Comcast outage on March the 5th that impacted many apps and services such as AWS, Salesforce and WebEx. I asked Mike to explain what happened. So at 7.45pm UTC, what we actually began to observe was some nodes within the Houston POP, so the Comcast Houston POP, exhibiting these outage conditions. And then when we actually went sort of downstream of that, we saw it started to impact a number of services. Uh, and this was coming from various locations. So if we were coming, for example, from San Jose and some uh, from San Francisco, we actually started to see some services hosted on AWS, some Salesforce and some WebEx instances actually sort of being impacted or some connections coming to from those. When she went in and we, we looked down into this, what we then started to see, as I say, we actually saw these loss occurring specifically within the Houston pop itself. So they have this architecture, it's sort of hierarchical architecture that's um, built on this leaf and spine type of a system. And then when we actually started to see, they're sort of semi-autonomous networks within themselves. So the traffic was coming into those and we saw some traffic actually passing through quite nicely. So, so it was just from some specific locations and it was really sort of came down to the type of applications that we're actually trying to pass. And it was really just this, this stuff was being lost and it couldn't actually forward itself to the end point. It didn't have this destination we actually reached. During this outage, some initially thought it was an AWS issue rather than a Comcast problem. What does this say about the importance of being able to quickly and accurately find the root cause of an issue? It was really interesting when you see that. It comes down to this sort of responsibility attribution. So where does the bottleneck or where does the uh, degradation actually occurring in, in my system? So you know, we talk about quite a lot about this concept of having to do this end-to-end -end service delivery chain, understanding all the dependencies. And when you think about how applications are constructed now, we've moved way away from the old days of client, magic happens here, cloud, server, this sort of simple architecture there. We've now got these other dependencies across there and you need to all of these have to work. Any one of those actually breaks, then you can't get down to it. But also the way then this system has a degradation is going to impact what it is or, or how this manifests itself to the users. Mike, give us an example of how problems occurred for customers trying to reach applications hosted on the AWS environment. So as the traffic traversed, we actually saw this path coming through, and then it was actually stopping us in the, in the Houston pop. Some traffic, which was going different paths, actually sort of got through. But because then this was going across to all different services that happened to be run on AWS, people sort of attributed the responsibility down to AWS, which actually got them to the point where they actually had to issue a statement to say, there's network issues occurring on an external provider. So this only comes to this importance. You really need to understand where it is, because if you understand where that degradation or bottleneck is, then you can start to take action to work around that to either mitigate it or put some other process in place. Those mitigations could include using a VPN to route traffic around the problem area. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. We said that this sort of manifests itself in the uh, in, in the path. And so we were coming from specific locations. And this was the path as we entered into the Comcast network, how we each went through. So we're looking at Comcast customers coming through. Now, this might be a downstream transit provider for, for your, your network. So you're not sure you're getting there. But I'm always knowing I'm coming from San Francisco, from San Jose, for example, in this case. Now, if I was to actually use something like a VPN, I could actually, or connect into a secure edge proxy or something like that, I all of a sudden have the appearance of my endpoint no longer being in San Francisco or San Jose. So effectively, I get this way of bypassing it. I could start to use another network. So I'm no longer using that transit path from there. Uh, but I've identified where that problem is. And now I say, right, the problem is in the path coming from there. So now I'm going to jump across. Okay, I've got my connectivity. I can now sort of work around from there. And again, this comes down to this point, if I understand my service delivery chain, then I can issue that process. When we see this, what we need you to do is to use a VPN and connect into the New York gateway or connect in for your SSE gateway that's that's based on the East Coast to sort of bypass this or make you give the appearance and use another network. Three 
three of Meta's best-known services, Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger, were rejecting logins for a period on March the 5th. Over to Mike to explain what occurred here. So Meta experienced, you know, we're going to call it an unexpected interruption. I think by definition, all interruptions are unexpected. Uh, but this actually, as you say, impacted these, these services. So when we actually started to take a look at the Facebook connection, the Instagram and Messenger, what we actually started to see is you could actually have network connectivity coming into that front door. So to the first server, you could actually have that connectivity. So you're able quite quickly to rule out then this is sort of a, a network problem. So we're looking at something in the back end. And then we actually looked at sort of transactions that are happening and that therefore we're not just sort of knocking on the front door. We want to see, can we authenticate to this, this server? Then we, we started to see these issues occurring where we were seeing sort of the errors, these 500 type of errors occurring in, in the back end where we actually couldn't sort of process, we couldn't connect to this system. So therefore, then you can sort of start to deduce what's happening. We're actually getting this problem. So first of all, we now know, okay, it's not on the network, it's in the back end. And then, like I say, it appeared to be it was impacting the authentication, which was sort of then verified by uh, Meta themselves, who said they were having issues with the login process. Login failures such as this often cause secondary problems, as users repeatedly attempt to re-enter their login details to access the service. That's exactly sort of what we saw, anecdotally what we, we saw. So when you actually connect, and we said we can get to the front door. So what happened was you saw the login page, but then when people, they either have their passwords within the system itself, or they actually type in their passwords again, the first thing they, they were getting back was this, your request could not be processed. So what happened then was they re-entered it again. And again, they got the same message coming back. Your request could not be processed. So they weren't necessarily privy to these service unavailable messages occurring in the back end, these sort of rejections they were seeing there. So what that then does is, is you know, straight away, I think my password's been compromised. It's been changed because I know this is the right password. I had it saved and I've typed it in three times, but now also I can't reset it. I can't get in. So Again, identifying where that problem is and how it manifests itself can lead to this situation where we make a misinterpretation of what's happening and essentially sort of take a different route down. So we start troubleshooting or start looking into an area where we're not aware. For example, while it's definitely not best practice, users may be using the same passwords for multiple accounts. If they're in that boat and think their Facebook password has been compromised, they might hurry to change their password for other accounts as well. I now need to go and change all my passwords across all systems. So all of a sudden I've generated all this other work that I need to undertake. Given that an authentication failure can cause alarm for customers, leading them to believe their account has been hacked, does that underline the importance of displaying accurate error messages when failures occur? Yes and no. I mean, it depends how that message comes back. So obviously, it would be really good. But if I put a 500 message up or, or, or a 400 message, you know, which is sometimes sort of, uh, sort of associated with sort of not found or not authorized from here, and there, it, it might not mean anything essentially to the users. What it really then comes down to is being able to sort of equate that error message to everything that, that we're seeing. So the first thing that I've, you know, I'm seeing here is, okay, is it impacting any of my other services? So again, you know, we can say, okay, I've got the network problem there. I start to, to look to see what's happening. Let's now look at this stage. Am I seeing a failure with the authentication problem? So it's, it's a really a combination. It sort of comes down to really sort of, you know, yes, we want to see sort of accurate message, but because of the nature of these messages, a lot of them are going to be customizable when they come back. So it's really having that data in context, I think is, is what I'm saying there. Another interesting aspect of the Meta outage was how we saw it hit Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger, but not the Meta-owned WhatsApp. Why did WhatsApp remain uninterrupted? If you looked at how, sort of how the outage manifests itself, and as I, I was saying, we could see when we were trying to authenticate to Facebook, we could actually see those areas. So this is where it was. And also the way we could see this again when we were looking at Instagram, because the way Instagram does when you're actually trying to load your feed in, it actually is doing the authentication in the background. So again, by looking at that transactional level, you can actually see what's happening. What we assume based on that is then the whole WhatsApp authentication system is separate. So if you think about how WhatsApp was acquired, so it was acquired by Meta, but it was essentially a separate entity. So as it came into your organization, and then if you, if you consider how it's actually set up and what it was actually designed to do in terms of the secure messaging system, what it was actually there would have been a separate authentication system. On the same day as the meta outage, Discord encountered some load-related issues. Can you tell us what happened there, Mike? 
So as you say, it was on the same day. It was actually during the meta outage there. Now, we, we have no direct correlation to say specifically it was the result of the meta outage. But what we actually saw or what came about was there was um, some load issues. So the uh, Discord began experiencing these issues that sort of prevented some users from loading guilds, which is sort of servers and starting new sessions. So as Discord said, the, uh, it was an actual an internal rate limit that had been triggered. So what they did was they put in a temporary bypass, which allowed pending sessions to start. And then four minutes later, the company said it was scaling up the service. So, you know, the way these things work is, is the ability then to sort of scale up and spin up to accommodate for load. And it was actually some issues they had doing that. The day after the Meta and Discord outages, another social media giant experienced disruption. Walk us through what happened at LinkedIn, Mike. So the next day, there was a bit of a bit of a space. So March the 6th, they experienced this outage. It lasted sort of just over an hour. And this, again, this was a global outage. So what we actually saw here was kind of interesting. We saw this lights on, lights off. So what I mean by that is we suddenly saw the service drop away. Now, when we actually looked at what was happening, and this was to the LinkedIn page. So this is when people were trying to get into LinkedIn and, and associated services. So it also we saw it occurring on LinkedIn ads, for example, where you, know, you couldn't actually get on similar type of system in terms of I couldn't authenticate. But the difference to this was, again, we could get to the front server. And in fact, LinkedIn actually use Azure Front Door as their CDN. So their ability you know, to sort of cut down that latency to serve the users quicker. And then they sort of backhaul that information to the LinkedIn data centers. So the first thing we saw, and why I mentioned that, is when we actually looked at it, as the outage was occurring, all of a sudden, this drop, like everything's sort of disappearing, we saw this uh, external error from the Azure front door. We actually saw it calling a uh, timeout at origin. Now, this can mean a number of things, but essentially what it means is exactly what it says on the label in terms of a timeout when we tried to connect to the origin server. Now, essentially what this really means, if I'm not getting an error back, now I don't know where this is. I can't establish a connection to that origin server. Now, this could be something within the network connecting that backend server there. But then what we saw just after this was we then started to see 503, HTTP 503 service unavailable message. These are server side messages. Now, what I mean by that is that we now know we can now make a connection to that server. It's saying that service is un unavailable. And in this case, it's just saying it's not ready to handle the request. So this is then what sort of started to occur. But I said the interesting thing was suddenly things disappeared. So we saw this lights on, lights off, this vertical drop in terms of the availability of this service. Then as it started to recover, we sort of we started to see some timeouts for the, the request going in there. We saw the 503s and then we switched to an HTTP 502, which was a bad gateway. At the same time, some of these systems were back up. So we're seeing HTTP 200 OKs. Everything was good. People could connect back in again. And when we saw these 502s, again, looking at that pattern where we saw the timeout at origin, then we saw the, uh, the 503s to the 502s, which means bad gateway message. The conclusion you can draw from that is that we can now get to the, the system. And it, it means either the server is unable to process the required or I'm too busy to handle that. That kind of flows in line with things are coming back online and we're now inundated with requests. Because remember, this wasn't the gradual comeback on. All of a sudden, the lights went back on and then we were able to connect into it. But they would have been inundated with requests. So, you know, a little bit like we were talking about sort of Discord outage, all of a sudden we have this unusual amount of traffic hitting it at one time or requests hitting it at one time and it's sort of taking time to process. But then it sort of came back up and surge restored and everything was great after that. And moving away from the social media firms, there was a rather unusual outage for viewers trying to watch their direct TV service recently. So direct TV is a, uh, a satellite service in, in the US. Now, they actually use geostationary satellites. And why this is interesting, again, if we're talking about that service delivery chain, you know, it's only as strong as the weakest link. And in this case, as I said, we're talking about geostationary satellite, which means that the dishes which take in the TV signal are sort of fixed and pointing to this satellite that's fixed in orbit. So we're always pointing up in the same place. We don't have to move. We don't have to retrain or hand off to this. But it also requires it to be specifically within the range. So you come down with like a sort of a cone in the area we're actually going to come into. Now, I can have my connection to my TV studio to do my broadcast, and I can do this, and I can back all this traffic really well over fiber and everything from there. But at some point, I have to go up over this satellite to get it into effectively that last mile into the, to the, the customer location. So, so what happened on this occasion is the geostationary satellite had moved slightly. So there's a couple of things people could have done. The whole of the US or the direct TV customers could have gone and realigned their dishes and sort of picked this up again. But what happens with the geostationary satellites is they do drift. They're, although they're on a fixed orbit around there, they're sort of stationary in their orbit, 
they do have fuel on board and they're controlled by mission control um, that, that actually sort of drive these satellites, um, sort of move them back into position when they come out of position. And essentially what would have happened in this case is was sort of drifted out and therefore then they need to sort of instigate a command which actually sort of brings it back into to play uh, and moves it back into this base because obviously getting everybody to realign those dishes is not practical. But why I find this interesting, as I said, is you know, we have all this connectivity stuff. And again, it's, you know, it's the old caught into a pint pot. If my connection is actually sort of broken at one point there, it doesn't matter how fast or how good my backend system is. If I don't have that every link of that service delivery chain in place, I'm not actually going to be able to get the signal. So that's turned to the overall outage trends. And what have you seen in the outage numbers over the past fortnight, Mike? During the last week of February and into March, the total number of global outages continues to decrease. Now, this is downward trend we've observed during the uh, the previous period. So as we came through the sort of the latter weeks of February, the number of outages then sort of dropped then and it's continued to drop. So we went from 165 to 155, and this was like a, a 6% decrease. And again, the following week, uh, we saw a further decrease of, of 8%. Things were slightly different in the US, but they sort of kind of followed a similar pattern. But initially, we saw an increase. So we saw an 18% increase where we went from 59 to 70. And but then it had decreased again, sort of by 10% the sort of the following week. It seems we're back in that familiar pattern, Mike, of leveling off after the January spike. When do you typically expect the next period of disruptions to occur? Now, as you say, if I actually look back over the years, I see this drop occurring. This is normal. I see this trend there. So what then tends to happen is as we sort of come out and we sort of come up into the Northern Hemisphere summertime, uh, we start to then see this increase for, of outages as occurring. So I can't necessarily predict exactly what's going to happen because things change. We're not dealing with an exact science here. We talk about the internet being unpredictable and change being constant. But what we have seen over the previous years is as we start to come into this northern hemisphere summer, so as we start to come sort of into May and June timeframe, we do tend to see this increase again before them sort of dropping off again and then coming out from that peak there. So it'll be interesting to see if, if, if a similar sort of thing happens again this time. And that's our show. Please like and subscribe. We really appreciate it. And not only does this ensure you're in the know when a new episode's published, it also helps us shape the show for you. You can follow us on X at, at Thousand Eyes or send questions and feedback to internetreport at thousandeyes.com. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>